Today we're going to explore TrueNAS Scale and their application catalog. We're going to dive into what applications TrueNAS Scale offers out of the box, and we're also going to add some more applications to that catalog. And we're also going to talk about the engine that's driving these applications, which is Docker and Kubernetes, but it may not be what you think. So let's dive into configuring applications in TrueNAS Scale. This is a brand new installation of TrueNAS Scale. Now, to install and configure applications, we'll want to go into the Apps tab. If you haven't configured this already, you'll need to assign a pool for your applications. So before we configure applications, you'll want to be sure you have a folder for data to persist for these applications. So the way that I do it is go into System Settings, then Shell, then we'll want to navigate to slash MNT and then your pool name, and then you'll want to create a directory for each of your applications. So if we wanted to install Plex, we would make a directory for Plex. And if we wanted a directory for Nextcloud, we would create one for Nextcloud. And so on and so forth. Now that we have our folders configured, we can install our application. And installing and configuring applications within Scale is pretty straightforward. Name the application, fill out some configuration, choose networking options, then choose storage options. This is why we created a folder first. Then we'll choose a scaling and upgrade policy. This is a little bit different, and this is hints at Kubernetes. But I typically choose kill all existing pods before creating new ones. If not, you'll end up in some networking snafu because one pod's trying to spin up with the same ports that the other one's using. So this is typically a safe bet. Resource reservation. So you can see I have some GPU configuration here. I don't have a GPU on this machine, but if I did, I could take advantage of it on this pod. You can also configure some advanced DNS options, which aren't necessary for apps like Plex or Nextcloud, and then you'll confirm your options. After you save this, it's actually going to install this application, but this is where it gets interesting. If we go to installed applications, we can see it's deploying, and then it becomes active. And if we want to visit this application, we can just click on Web Portal. And here we are in our default Plex installation. So no surprises there, but there are. We'll talk about that here in a second. So what happens if you want to install more applications, ones that you don't see here? We can fix that by adding another catalog. So if we go into catalogs, we only see the official TrueNAS charts, but we can add unofficial ones too. TrueCharts is an open source project that has pre-configured applications for TrueNAS scale. Behind the scenes, it's using Helm and charts to configure these applications for you. It's the same technology that TrueNAS scale is using now. It's really easy to add. So to add it, we'll just add a catalog. We'll name this TrueCharts. We'll specify this repository right here. This will be in the documentation. And we want to be sure that our release train is set to stable. And we'll also want to be sure that our branch is set to main. And then we'll save this, get a warning saying it might take some time. And if we look in our task manager, we can see it pulling down this catalog and validating it. After the catalog syncs, now in available applications, we'll see a lot more applications. And again, these are all thanks to the open source project called TrueCharts. And this is huge because this gives our NAS a ton of applications. So for example, if we wanted to install PyHole, we could search for it. We can install it. We'll name it PyHole. Next, we'll see some additional configuration. And this is Kubernetes configuration, actually. For most workloads, you can ignore this. But if you show advanced configuration, you'll see some Kubernetes options, like the deployment type, desired replicas. Most likely, this is going to be one. And then your update strategy, which we saw in the official one which most likely you'll want to say kill existing pods before creating a new one. So we won't touch anything in here, just know that it's there. Next, you'll have some container configuration, which this is some configuration for that pod. You want to set the time zone to your time zone, and then you'll want to set an unmask variable. And this is important for Linux server.io containers. Now we see app specific configuration, what we want our web password to be, what our DNS that we use for PyHole externally, as well as a secondary DNS externally. And in the network settings, we're seeing yet some more Kubernetes settings. So we see the service type is set to simple. That's going to be the default option for most. But you have options like cluster IP, node port, and load balancer. You're most likely not going to choose any of these. Simple is going to be good enough. But if we wanted a cluster IP, that only exposes it internally to the cluster. And node port exposes this container's ports on this node, which is our TrueNAS scale server. And then load balancer exposes it as a type of load balancer, which is a Kubernetes object. And if you had a cloud load balancer or metal LB, it would tell that load balancer to expose or give this machine an IP on that load balancer. But we're not going to touch any of this. 
Next, we'll configure some ports we're going to expose. These are the default. Same goes with DNS. It's set to simple. This is going to be the choice for most options in here. Then we'll hit next. Next, we have storage options. Now, this isn't what we saw in other charts, nor what you're used to in TrueNAS scale. The default storage type is PVC or simple. So PVC, again, is a Kubernetes term, and it stands for persistent volume claim. So within Kubernetes, you have a storage system and pods can request storage from that storage system so that they can persist data to it. So these are all pre-configured with PVC or persistent volume claim, and we really shouldn't change it there. So this help here says sets the persistent type, anything other than PVC could break rollback. So you'll wanna be sure on these charts that PVC is selected. Next, we're gonna choose an ingress, and so that's how traffic gets into this pod. Again, a Kubernetes term. I don't think we need to configure anything here, but just know that it's there if you need an ingress for any of your services in the future. That's more advanced configuration. So let's hit next. Security and permissions. So these are the permissions that this pod runs as. These are set for us already, and we shouldn't need to change any of these. But if you have a container that requires specific permissions, just know that this is where you would change it. Resources and devices. Again, this is a Kubernetes construct. But here you could set custom resource definitions. If you wanted to constrain the CPU or RAM, you would do so here. And you can also set the minimum that this pod requests when it's deployed in Kubernetes. Again, the default should be fine here and you shouldn't need to touch any of this. Just know that it's here if you need to change it. Add-ons, this is super nice. So if you had a pod that required VPN to access anything going out, you would choose your VPN provider here. So here you can specify OpenVPN or WireGuard. And next in advanced, as if this wasn't already advanced enough, we have advanced settings. So here we have our HPA settings or a horizontal pod autoscaler and an additional network policy. So HPA or horizontal pod autoscaler is just a way to allow this pod or group of containers to scale based on demand. Most likely you're not gonna use this, so just know that it's here. But this again is a Kubernetes construct and they're exposing it in the UI so that if you need to use it, you can. So we're not gonna turn on HPA. And then we have some advanced network settings. Again, for most users, we're not gonna use this, but you could set the policy type for this network policy. So we're just gonna uncheck this. Then we'll wanna confirm all of our options, then hit save. Then if we go back to our installed applications, we can see PyHole is now deploying. Then you might think to go to web portal, but you don't, that's the PyHole default port. So you actually wanna go into the admin UI. And here we go, PyHole is up and running. So what do you do if you wanna install an application that's not available from the official charts or true charts? Well, we have the ability to fall back to any Docker container anywhere that you have access to. And you can find that in launch Docker image. So if we click launch Docker image, this is really an ad hoc mode. So let's say for instance, we wanted to install an NTP server in a container. Just call this NTP. Next, we specify the Docker image. The Docker image I use is a Ctura NTP. And if you don't specify the repository, it's going to pull from Docker Hub. But I think you can also override the repository that you pull from if you specify the fully qualified domain name. But that's my own container and we don't want to use that, just for an example. So let's say NTP, then we'll choose the image tag. If you want to look at the images tag on Docker Hub, you would look for tags. Unfortunately, this one only has latest. So we'll keep latest here. Image pull policy defines whether or not we should pull this image if it doesn't exist already, we should. We don't need to set a container entry point here. If you did, this is where you do it, but this is a command to run once that container starts up. Container environment variables, you wanna pay attention to this. So if we needed to add an environment variable, we would click add, and then we have a key value pair of the environment variable. So if we look at this NTP server, we can see that we can configure the NTP server that this looks at. For example, we can set the NTP server here to Cloudflare's time server. So let's grab that. So we're gonna set the NTP server's environment variable to the value of time.cloudflare.com. And you can configure this with whatever you want. Next is networking, and this is internal pod networking, how it resolves DNS names. Most likely you're gonna keep this to default where it inherits how to resolve DNS names from the host that it's on. So we're gonna keep this to default. Next is port forwarding, and you wanna pay attention to this if the container that you're running requires networking. So in this container, we actually need to publish from the inside of this container, port 123, to the outside of this container 123 on UDP. So let's configure that. 
So the container port is one, two, three. The node port is one, two, three. However, we get an error here. That's because of the way that networking works on here. So we can't expose a port lower than 9,000 here. So let's choose port nine, one, two, three. Then we'll set the protocol to UDP. Go to next. And next for storage, we would configure any bind mounts or any kind of mounting that we need to do. And this is only for containers that require persistence. This time server that I'm running is totally stateless, so it doesn't need to persist anything to disk. But if you did, you would choose a host path on your TrueNAS scale server to mount to that containers path here. So for example, if you needed to, it would be slash MNT, then the pool name, and then the name of the application or the folder you created earlier. And then let's say, for example, that was into the pod slash config. But again, we don't need this, so we can delete it. And then in workloads, we have a few advanced options. Most likely, you're not gonna check any of these. Enabled TTY would be enabling, I think, input and output to this pod, which doesn't really make sense because it's running headless. Then whether or not it has standard in enabled. Again, it's running headless. I don't think we need this. And then whether or not it's running in privilege mode. You probably absolutely do not need this. Unless your image says that it needs to be run as root or in privilege mode. So here's where you'd find it. We don't need to check any of that. So the next options are just the same we saw when we were configuring a chart app. So we don't need to talk about those. Then we'll confirm our settings, go back to installed applications, then we can see that this is active. Interestingly, even though this was an ad hoc one, it says it's from official charts. Maybe this is their way of saying it's coming from Docker Hub? I don't know, should be an ad hoc icon or something. But anyways, this container now we can see is running and it's exposing 9123 UDP. So we can access this time server on this port of 9123. Not the greatest example because most of your applications that want to sync time are going to do so on 123 but you can see how this works. But from here, we can actually check on these applications too. If we click on the hot dog menu, we can see we have an option for logs. If we open up the logs, then we'll need to choose a log. Pods here is Kubernetes again. If we had multiple pods running, we could choose which pod, and then the name of the container itself, and then tail the lines. So let's choose this. And here we can see the pod logs for our application. And we can do the same on any of our other applications here too. Choose Pi-hole, see our container logs, and go back. Super nice to be able to get to those. But we could also shell into these or exec into these pods themselves. So if we had multiple pods running, we would choose it. We would choose the container name, and then we would choose the command to run. Most likely this is gonna be slash bin slash sh. So choose the defaults. So if we exec into this pod, we're actually inside of this container that's running. So if we needed to do some troubleshooting or modification of the files inside of there, we would do it here. Or you could do it on the file system itself where it's mounted. But this again is a Docker and Kubernetes construct, being able to exec into a running container. So let's exit out of there. So if we wanted to delete one of these running applications, it's pretty obvious we would do it here and delete. And we would confirm whether or not we wanted to delete this and then delete the application itself. And so that should clean up most of it. However, you might wanna look in your managed Docker images. So now that this is using Docker, it's actually caching all of these images on this machine. And we can see here, even though my container isn't running anymore and doesn't exist, we still have that image cached. So if you need to clean up Docker images, just go in here, delete this image, confirm to delete, and clean it up there. Pretty awesome. We can run official applications, which are Kubernetes applications that are installed via Helm. We can run unofficial ones from true charts, but installed the same way. We can launch Docker images, which is actually doing the same thing. It's actually deploying an application to the Kubernetes cluster that's running. And we can clean up and delete and manage applications almost the same as we could before. But let's pull back the curtain a little bit and see what's going on with TrueNAS. I'm sure a lot of people will ask, can I use Docker Compose? Can I use Kube Control? Or can I use Helm commands directly from the terminal? Or even remotely from another machine and deploy them that way? Kinda. I mean, you could if you really wanted to, but you probably shouldn't. So if I SSH into this TrueNAS scale server and I run Docker PS, we can see that we actually have lots of Docker containers that are running. We can see kind of behind the scenes what's going on with Docker. And I found out that under the covers, they're actually running K3S. So we can run a K3S kube control get pods all, and we can see those same pods running. And if I dig a little bit further, I can see our K3S configuration here. 
And if I do a K3S coop control get nodes, I can only see one node. And this node has the role of control plane and master. And it's also running all my workloads. So this tells me there's a K3S or Kubernetes cluster that's running only a single node. And this node then runs Docker containers for pods. So why do you need to know this? You really don't need to know this. This is totally just for science and me looking around. Because I was really hoping that I can deploy to my TrueNAS scale server from a remote machine or use Kubernetes commands to actually orchestrate some deployments. Now, I don't know if that's coming in the future, but I really hope it is. Which leads me to my question, will we ever get access to this Kubernetes cluster? Is it just there as a way to spin up Docker containers and use Helm charts at the same time? Will TrueNAS scale ever allow me to scale my Kubernetes cluster across TrueNAS scale nodes? Super interesting, certainly hope so. So what do you think about installing applications on TrueNAS scale? What do you think about using TrueNAS scale with Docker, Kubernetes, Helm, so that we can pull in applications across the larger community of container images? Let me know in the comment section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Long story short, um, if, if you're new to the stream, you earn channel points just by being here. I wrote a whole bunch of code and a whole bunch of stuff to all of my lights to control the lights that are in here. That code is actually self-hosted inside of my Kubernetes cluster that's inside of my home lab. Uh, and it's wired up to Twitch. So I wrote everything end to end just so you guys can change the lights. Yeah, this is bright. This is like sci-fi bright. This is like I'm like in a spaceship or something. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, <laughs> that is no air trimming brightness. It is pretty bright.